now to an absolute minimum. Um, but if you have a question that you want to ask, or if I'm asking a question, then by all means um, respond to it. I'm going to keep the chat window up, but let's see how it goes. So today we're going to do a, what is called a stylistics analysis of a poem called London by William Blake. Now, year nine have not studied the poem yet, unless their teacher um, has done it in advance of when they should have done it. Um, and year 10 probably have done it once, and year 11 should have done it at least once, and year 13 should have done it for GCSE, and again for A-level. So they should be experts, really. So this is why it's useful for year 13. And um, if you've had time, year nines, or those of you who haven't done it in year 10, to have looked at the poem and taken some notes, that's fantastic. Having a copy of the poem is useful, but this isn't a lesson. This isn't something you have to submit anything for. All right, I'd be, it'd be great to see some notes, but you don't have to do anything. There's no assignment, okay? No stress at all. So the, a lot of the ideas that come from, uh, from this lecture um, come from Aston University, um, but I attended a course um, that was held by Aston University, which is in Birmingham. Um, and I that course, oh, my phone's ringing. There you go, good teaching. Um, I attended the course and it was on a poem by Wilfred Owen. Um, and I've used the I, some of the ideas from that course to help you with this poem. So London by William Blake. I don't expect anyone at all in the room to know what stylistics means. Um, I don't know if you do. If you do, type it into the chat window. But if you don't, just let, wait and listen. So stylistics um, is a way of analysing anything that is in a written form. So it could be a poem. It could be a novel, short story, a play, nonfiction, anything uh, at all that takes a very, very, very close look at the words that are used. Now, that might sound stupid or obvious to you, but if you think carefully about how your teachers are teaching poetry or how your teachers are teaching Macbeth or something like that, what we get is we tend to get a mixed bag of different things going on at the same time. Stylistics is totally, totally focused on the words and their meaning and the patterning and lots and lots of other things as well that we aren't all going to get, we're not going to get through the whole lot today. So this is the, this is what we're going to do today. All right. Um, it is basically very close analysis and there isn't time to do this poem justice, even in 45 minutes, but we will do what we can. So let's start. Why would you use a stylistics analysis of poetry? Okay, so there are some good reasons why you might want to use language analysis to focus on literature. First and foremost, the poem is made up of words. All right, I don't think we can argue with that. Um, but what we do is we use ideas from language study to analyze literature. I know that some of you are going off to do A-level literature with us or, or at a different center. Um, I don't know if anyone's doing A-level English language, um, but A-level English language is very different to what you get at GCSE. Um, and linguistics is basically the majority of the course. And we will be doing a bit of that today. Um, <clears throat> stylistics, it helps explain our interpretations and those of others. It gives us a framework and it provides a common ground for discussing ideas about a text. Um, and well, I was putting this PowerPoint together and I kept thinking, actually, this would be really good for everyone, not just for grade seven to nine. This would be great for absolutely everybody. Um, it gets complicated later on in the session, but at its very basic level, it is the best way to address an unseen poem or any poem at all that you uh, are examined on or in just for enjoyment. If you if you read poetry to enjoy it, fantastic as well. So let's have a look at um, some of the basics of stylistics. Um, <clears throat> this is from um, Wainwright. He says most stylistics is not simply to describe the formal features of text for their own sake, but in order to show their functional significance for the interpretation of the text. 
So it's not about um, spotting, for example, the rhyme. It's not about spotting a simile. It's not about feature spotting, but it's about thinking about how those features function and what they mean, how it operates, how it, how it helps us shape our understanding of that poem. Does that make sense? So like, for example, if there's a simile in, the, in a poem, um, and London doesn't include any, but if there's a simile in a poem, you can analyze that simile in isolation, all right? Oh, I've spotted a simile. What does that mean? Or you can see how it works alongside everything else in the poem. And that is what is, it, that's what stylistics is really all about. Um, let's move on. Now, I'm not expecting anybody at all to read every word on this slide, nor am I expecting you to do anything with it. But the big picture, but so, so this is like a glossary of terms. I reckon there's some of you in this room who would really benefit from looking at the slide again at some point. So stylistics experts, if you go and do a degree in English um, and you do a course on stylistics, you would be expected to know and be able to explain all of this. Um, can you say, let's do, should we do, do one interactive activity straight away? So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15-ish, maybe I've miscounted slightly, 15 bullet points there with different methods. Um, can you give me a number out of 15? It's giving me an idea of how many you're comfortable with, or is that really too personal to ask? 14, okay, good counting. So can you tell me how many of those you are comfortable with as a student? Um, if I was to ask you to define or identify, don't feel like you have to be, um, worried about putting half down or a, a small number. I'm interested, that's all. Okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, what, what I was expecting is that the majority of you probably know the majority of these things already. And that's, that, that was intentional. Yeah, so don't worry, Blake, if there's only six. Um, the six that you know and the six that you understand are the six that could get you your grade nine, if we care about grade nines at this point. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to, as a stylistic analysis, I want to be able to pick the things that matter the most from the big picture first. Yeah, so this is what I, what I call with my classes zooming out. Yeah, you'll notice that all of these things are zoomed out, the big picture. And then, should we do the same thing here? So this is line by line analysis. So, so you know when I put a poem under a project, a visualizer or whatever, and I, I analyze every line word by word. Um, there are what, 12 here? How many of these are you comfortable with? Don't feel like you have to answer, but uh, give me a snapshot of, of what your expertise is. which are, you're comfortable with, you'd be able to spot, you'd be able to write about maybe. Okay, so we're, li well, similar, similar percentage wise, right? Somewhere between eight and 10, a few with a few more. So that's interesting to me. Um, I'm not going to ask you which ones you don't know. Um, I'm just gonna plow ahead with this presentation. But I think this line by line and big picture stuff that's that's the, the meat of my subject really um that's the those are the things that you need to be able to do um and and when you come to write creatively to be able to use yourself we're doing a poem today but some of this most of this um works in prose as well okay um does anyone want to tell me what stylistics can you guess what stylist stylistics is not bothered with what does stylistics not care about? Oh, Jack, I think the exact opposite. 
Uh, narrator might be interesting. In fact, narrator is interesting, but it's interesting in a slightly different um, way to the way that you might be thinking. Okay, so writer. Oh, the hang on, Billy. The writer's method is absolutely what we're interested in. Um, the thing that we are not interested in is the writer, him or herself. So we aren't interested in the their background. We're not interested in their biography. We're not interested in their history. To put it bluntly, we're not interested in context at all. Pretty much, as Jack says. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, context is not part of the stylistics approach at all. Now, I'm um, of the opinion that you can't totally separate context from what you're reading. So please be careful. Um, and AO3, which is the um, assessment objective for context, Charlie, very good. It's also the assessment objective for context at A-level, is part of the mark scheme. So you might be wondering why I'm doing a session where I'm telling you or advising you not to think about context, particularly with a poem like London, which is driven by context. And actually, it's because context, and this is controversial, but context, students don't write about very well. Students tend to think that just knowing lots of facts about William Blake and the French Revolution is going to get them lots of marks. And actually, context is not what an English teacher or an English examiner is interested in. The, the blunt truth of it is you're much, much, much better off writing loads and loads and loads about similes and metaphors and imagery and not mentioning context once, by and large. All right. It's in the mark scheme, though, so we can't ignore it entirely. And I have got like a five minute burst at the end where I mention context again. It isn't history, correct. So I thought I would do a read through of the poem. Um, so those of you who've already read the poem um, or know the poem well can kind of just switch off. But if you don't know the poem um, very well at all, it might be worth paying attention now as I read it. Um, can we not have anything in the chat window just for the reading? And then I'll open the chat window back up again um, I can't actually, I could disable chat, I don't really want to. I'm sure you can avoid chatting for a few minutes. Okay, so here we go. This is London by William Blake. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with planes the marriage hearse. Now, you'll notice if you are picky that there are no apostrophes in the poem. Actually, there are, there are apostrophes for abbreviation, but no apostrophes for ownership because Blake didn't use them in his engravings. Um, but you're going you're gonna to stop me when I talk about context, and therefore I don't want to talk about engravings. Let's move on. That's the poem then, a wonderful poem, a dark, bleak, cynical poem, very much of its time, but a poem very much still relevant. Again, context, stop me, type in the chat window when I talk about context and tell me off. Okay, here's a chance to make some notes if you want to. Now, Jeffrey Wainwright um, wrote a brilliant book, um, quite a long time ago, actually, and it was republished in 2016. And he made the analogy that uh, and saw a poem as a prayer mat, which I really like. Um, so here's a picture of a prayer mat in case you haven't seen one. When I used to live and te teach in Bahrain in the Middle East, prayer mats were very much part and parcel of um, daily existence. Um, and prayer mats are not just a, a Muslim thing. 
But this idea that, you know, the map that you prey on, that you kneel on, that you genuflect on is, um, is like a deliberate space. It's something that is set up, set out, that is a particular place that is crafted and adapted and is different to the outside world. So that analogy for me works in the way that I feel about a poem. It's a bit pretentious, but that's how I feel about a poem. So he said, just as a prayer mat is made out of fabric found everywhere, everywhere, but once laid out, marks a space from the surrounding daily world, so does the shape of a poem organise language into a space for pause and for different attention. Now, some people find poetry really hard and some people find it boring. The, the people who find it boring tend to be the people who aren't giving it a chance, to be fair. Um, and because poems are very, very kind of deliberate, methodical places and spaces, they need to have the right mindset, just like a prayer mat needs to have its right mindset. So I quite like this analogy. I quite like the way that it thinks through the idea of the shape, the space, the structure, the format of a poem being like a prayer mat. Now, here's a chance to start making notes if, if, if you're waiting to make notes, that is. So we're, we're going to work through a few different exercises that a stylistic uh, analysis would use. I want to say stylistician. Is that the right term? I don't know. I should know, shouldn't I? So the first thing we're going to look for are patterns, and I'm going to ask you to share with me some ideas, if that's all right. But just for now, hold back on the chat window still, and let's think about what I mean by patterns. So within a poem, within your prayer mat of a poem, and London is today's prayer mat, we have internal patterns, so patterns that, that kind of fit within the poem. They might be words that are repeated or shapes the way in which stanzas are formatted, or the way in which maybe we have some degree of symmetry. This could be the meaning of the words, or it could be the appearance of the words. And we have external patterns as well, because there are forces coming from outside onto the poem. I'll explain that in a bit more detail later. Within, the, within any poem, we have a voice. We have this idea of voice. Um, and there is a voice that kind of um, dominates maybe the, the narrator, to use Blake's word, or we might have um, a speaker, like in a monologue or a dramatic monologue, and we might have other voices, and those other voices might be heard or they might be silent, and you can see how this would work in, not just in poetry, couldn't you? So what, what I'm looking for, the way in which voices work. Um, text with and against other texts, so that might be the way in which the poem kind of reflects on a specific idea um, that we've seen elsewhere. That's not the same as context. So do you remember the Macbeth lecture that I did last month? Well, we had lots of, lots of religious allusions from the Old and New Testament, and we thought about the way in which those were kind of working their effect and their magic on Macbeth. And the one that I want to do the most of um, to start with is clashes and tensions, because it's the most interesting, it's the easiest, and it's probably the most fruitful. So let's do a little bit of that. So I'm going to ask you to give me, I'll give you 60 seconds, um, and I want you to find, and you can put them down in whatever format you want in the chat window, or you can choose not to, because it's not one of those things where I wait for five minutes and no one does anything. If, you, if you've got nothing to say, that's fine. But I want you to find within the poem where there are clashes or tensions, all right? Another way of putting that might be contrasts and opposites, but it doesn't have to be. When we talked about juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is one of those words that um, is a bit overused. So a juxtaposition can be anything where we put two things together with any kind of difference at all. But I'm looking here for things that clash or that are tense. So you've got the idea, I'll shut up. Give yourself 60 seconds, I'll turn my mic off.
Okay, so that is how an online lesson should be. All those brilliant ideas coming through. Yeah, this is how this is how online teaching should be. And um, we know it isn't always like that, don't we? Okay, so there are some fantastic ideas. Um, I'm very conscious that I don't want to overrun. So I've looked at those as they've come in. Um, and I think they show incredible knowledge already of what we're trying to do. Um, let me give you my responses and you can tick them off if you want. Um, I haven't done all of them. I actually went through this earlier today and I, I, I thought that I'd found about 14 or 15 different clashes or tensions in the poem. That's incredible, isn't it? That is what you want to write about. This is a tense poem. This is a poem that is politically um, angry, that is, you know, Blake is angry. And the conflict that's set up is what you really want to write about, in my opinion. So let's have a look and see the sorts of things that maybe you might want to do. And I'm very, very happy for you to keep the ideas coming in. Ah, uh, Blake. You, you happen to have the same surname as the poet, but William Lake, also in the room, is probably also considering wondering wh why I'm talking about him all the time. OK, so. I did some underlining to try and help you, and that is um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. I basically spotted six that I thought were, were nice to, to explain with you. So I've done a little bit of analysis for you. So this is where I would consider kind of grade eight, grade nine analysis to, to be hitting using a stylistics approach. So somebody's already mentioned this. Look at the word wonder and look at the word chartered. So chartered means map own, laid out, um, control. And look at the verb wonder. Wonder suggests freedom. It suggests aimlessness, actually. Um, as William Blake I, I would say Blake is the person who's the, the narrator here in this, this time round. Um, and he's talking about the fact that he's wandering through what are effectively streets where he shouldn't wander. Um, and that, you know, that is very contained and mapped and owned to be chartered. So we have a contrast, a clash of that idea. We have the flow of the Thames as well um, and the charter. That's something else we'll come back to again later. So we have the opposition of to be mapped and to be controlled and to flow. Now, a river also is free, is man, is, is not man made, is, is God made, is, nat is a natural phenomenon. Um, and here it's being exploited, it's being polluted as well, it's being chartered for the good of the rich and powerful. Context, don't do context. My son is here. Hello, Felix. Hello, Daddy. Yes, Felix. Um, Felix has come to say hello. I shouldn't really want to move on. Do you want to come and say hello? No. Okay, then. Off you go. Um, 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 Daddy, I want to tell something. Daddy, I want to tell okay. something. Daddy! Do you want to tell me? Um, um, Daddy, I'm playing a rock and roll one. Okay, I'll come down in half now. Yeah, All right, bye. Yeah, <laughs> oh dear, did you see me waving him away? Oh, that's bad parenting. Oh dear. Hi, Felix. Right. I was going to introduce it to you to him. There we go. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, how half a child. <laughs> Good, thanks. We're going to overrun. Um, so we have tension between the word cry and man, perhaps, as well. Look at the capitalization of the, um, the kind of the big ideas. Um, so cry and man, there's tension there. There is the contrast of entrapment. So we have the manacles, which are chains, aren't they? And we have the word ban, which is a restriction. And then we have wander and flow. So we have contrast and clashes there as well. Then we've got this idea of synesthesia. So synesthesia is where we're mixing senses up. So we've got something that's mind forged. Um, man has created these laws and traps for man, 
interesting that manacles um, uses the etymology of man as well. Um, and I think that that is perhaps a deliberate choice by Blake. And to hear the manacles, well, we know that manacles rattle, the chains rattle, but they are manacles of the mind. They are forged in the mind. Therefore, they're visual elements rather than something we can hear. So there's a tension there, perhaps, as well. Yeah, there's some good comments going on in the chat window, including some I didn't want. But, you know, I'm going to try and ignore those for now. So this is a real, two or three of you picked up on this, this is my favorite one to write about as well. Look at the way in which the church is described as blackening. So traditionally, the church would be seen as good, as white, as charitable. Um, we associate churches, don't we, often with, um, with symbolism that is white, with candles and angels and halos and doves and things like that. Peace is white. Well, here the church is blackening, partly because of the chimneys being needing sweeping, but also because metaphorically those chimney sweeps have been shoved up the chimneys to do their dirty work. So the chimneys, the churches, sorry, should be appalled. Now the word appall means to turn white. So there's this in really fascinating tension between color imagery here of the church, which is traditionally white, becoming black from the soot and then becoming white again through shock and horror because of the way it's treating children. Um, and then a lot of you have picked up on, it's kind of an oxymoron. It's very much a tension um, between birth, the prostitute gives birth to a child, presumably with a married man, although that's implied, um, and the child becomes sick potentially, um, and the marriage is sick, the marriage is killed off. So this is this idea of births, marriages and deaths, a circular thing. Blake is saying, if you are unlucky enough to be born poor in London, you're going to be born um, into poverty. You're going to be shoved up a chimney. If you're lucky enough to survive being shoved up a chimney, you're going to come back down again and you're going to go to war. You're going to die for your country. You potentially, if you manage to... Um, if you're born female, you're going to be a prostitute and you're going to die from a venereal disease or you're going to pass it on to the next next child. So this is an incredibly bleak poem, um, but I'm going on context here. So you need to tell me off a little bit because context is not what we want to be doing. There's some really good points going on in the chat window. Um, now, I'm disappointed, slightly disappointed. Um, my year 13s who are here, you've not mentioned another clash or attention, innocence and experience. However, yes, Jack, absolutely. Year 13 will tell you. Um, but innocence and experience are important, but they're not in the poem. So it's context. So I'm glad you didn't mention that, actually. Um, there's a clash and attention between the world as it is and the world as it could or should be, although this is not a utopia. Uh, we're not given the positive spin, we're given the negative spin, or the reality, if you prefer. And definitely power and powerlessness um, in the text. So what I'm trying to do here, and this is what you can do with any of the poems in the anthology, or any unseen poem that comes up, find the opposites. I don't, I don't want to say opposites, actually. I want to say find the clashes, find the tension, find the bits that don't work easily together. Find the things that are at odds with each other and then try and explain why that's set up. Look at all the opposites and clashes and tensions in this poem and you can see that it's angry, that it's dissatisfied, that it's uneasy. That this is a poem that you should be able to analyse simply from analysing the opposites, from analysing the clashes and tensions. Does that make sense? You've got methods there. You've got context because I couldn't resist talking about context, and you won't either. Um, and all of those things wrapped up in this text, that's an essay in itself. That would be a great essay. Kez has said, and six people have liked it, so it must be good, marry to death as power won't change poverty. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. And um, that, that to be in London is, 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 in a sense, to be married to death. Awesome point. 
Now, I don't know if that was hard or easy, but this bit could be easier. I'm going to go quite quickly through this. So this a stylistics approach would look for those things, but actually this might come before it if you found it hard. We need to ask ourselves in any poem, if we're a stylistic expert, one, what is happening? Two, who is speaking? And about whom and where are they speaking? And three, why are they speaking? Um, does anyone want to chip in anything simple or more sophisticated for any of those? One, what is happening here? Two, who is speaking about whom and where? And three, why are they speaking? Does anyone have anything? I'll give you, give, give you 30 seconds if you're typing something. Okay. So two good answers already. Three good answers. Okay, so I did this and I'll show you my responses. I think I did it. Blake's point of view, yeah. So I've done this in a quite a kind of a grade five way. Let's look at a grade five way. What is happening here? A person, the poet, walks around the city of London and notices the things around him and other things he may believe to be happening behind closed doors, like the church, like the palace, yeah? Like the brothel, potentially, as well. So that's number one. I've answered the question. Number two, who is speaking about whom and where? Okay, well, on first reading, we don't know any context. Let's pretend we've never read the poem before. We've not studied it. Who is speaking? Well, is it a local, a tourist? Is it about London? For sure, about London. The poem's title gives us that. Every means that we're looking at um, lots of people, but also specific men and women later on in the text as well. Um, and why are they speaking? Well, I said that the person feels the need to address the crises facing Londoners. It's a revelatory piece. He wants to educate. He wants to make others aware. Now, you can, uh, most of you could probably aren't uh, and have given me ideas like that in your chat, in the chat window. Yeah? What's happening? Who's speaking? About whom and where? Why are they speaking? Now, if we use a stylistics approach, we need to go one step further and take the language from the poem and apply it to the question. OK, which is what you need to do in an exam. So that looks a bit more like this. What is happening here and who is speaking? I've tied together a little bit here. So I, first person, wonder, he's aimless, free will. Marks, like Billy's use, remarks, means to notice. There are verbs in the poem. Don't forget that verbs are happening words, aren't they? Verbs this idea of um, actions and behaviours and the things that are carried out. So the verbs in the poem will show us what's happening, won't they? The river flows. It's the only freedom that we get to see in the poem. The river flows. Everything else is negative. Cry, sigh, runs in blood, curse, blasts, blights. All of those words are, all of those verbs are negative. Jack, that's a great point about the style of Flania walking around commenting on sites. Juxtapose a commentary on poverty. Yes, absolutely. This is a commentary. I think I've used that word later on. Um, who is speaking? I. Who's the I? Blake will accept that it's Blake, although you shouldn't assume. Relationship to others. He's external, right? But he's visionary, right? He's a Londoner. We know that he's a Londoner. That's context. but. You know, we, it's an assumption, but he's external to a lot of the pain and suffering, it seems. So it's much he's much closer to events than you and I. But actually what he is, is a commentator to go back to Jack's point. And um, I'm turning the chat window off because it's so brilliant and it's so distracting. And um, he's a journalist. It's journalistic. It's reportage. Yeah, the Flanier point. Brilliant point. It's a personal response. Is he shocked and disgusted? Well, there's not that 
that strength of emotive language isn't there really. Um, but there are emotive and shocking images in the poem. And he leaves what he thinks is the worst till the end of the day and the end of the poem, but most. Why are they speaking? Well, they're speaking because they want to educate and inform the reader through shock and horror, through the language of violence, the language of war is used, and the suggestion of an ongoing conflict. Who's the conflict between? It's not between the French um, and you know the, the, the monarchists and the revolutionaries. It's not about that. It's about the fact that there's conflict within the city of London and within its, its structure. Okay, now I'm moving on slightly. I'm gonna, what I'll do is I'll trawl through the chat window when I feel like it's time. I feel like I'm gonna overrun slightly here, but I will not overrun beyond 5.30 because I've got to, to make my son's dinner. All right, so here is the poem again. And what I've done, I've done it for you because I knew it'd take ages. I've listed the nouns in the poem. All right, this is what a stylistics analysis is all about, breaking things down. Look at all those nouns. We can argue one or two might be considered to be um, kind of adverb, adverbials, but there they are. All right, there's lots, aren't there? Are we sure, sure we know what a noun is? Does everyone know what a pronoun is? Are we confident with what a pronoun is? Blake, you're on a warning, you cannot say things like that. Okay, so we know what a, we know what a pronoun is. Yeah, okay, so a pronoun takes the place of a noun. So any of these nouns in the list that you can see on the screen there could be replaced by something like it, or he, or they, or she, um, or I. So how many pronouns are there in the poem? I don't want to spend too long doing this. How many pronouns are there in the poem? Only a couple. Can you name them? Yeah, there's only one. It's I. And it's repeated multiple times. Okay. So some of you have taken that point on already and have thought about how you could write about it, which is fantastic, Jack, brilliant. Singularity, loneliness, opinion, a personal account, all of those things, but there are lots of nouns. So it's not, it's not totally singular or lonely, I don't think. So I would want to make the point, look, I've done this for you again to make it really, really clear. Um, there's all your nouns, and they're all very specific. Look at them. They're very specific. They, they pinpoint specific things, specific places, specific ideas, specific images. Like I know that man is very general and vague, but if you look at the word blood, if you look at the word soldier, if you look at the word church, you've got an image in your head that is absolutely the shorthand for those things. You're thinking the same thing as me. I'm pretty sure of that. So all of these nouns are what we would call very concrete nouns. And yet there's only one pronoun. If you look at the other 14 poems in the anthology, I haven't done this, but I, I want you to have a look. You will see that this is, I would, I would bet my, what am I gonna bet? And nothing really. I'll bet something, I shouldn't be gambling anyway, uh, but I'll bet something that this is the only poem with only one pronoun used. This is 20 quid, okay. You have to do the research now. So I'm reckoning that this is the only poem with only one pronoun. And this poem therefore suggests to me that I is very important, but the other things in the poem are also important. And that's what a stylistics analysis would want would want to present. You know, Jack talked about the middle class. Oh, Blake was working class, but had a job and, you know, worked in the church. I've read a lot about William Blake's life. He was unusual and eccentric. But I, I think that you want to see this idea um, about pronouns and nouns and see if you can write about it, weave it in. 
OK, so I've done this. So. A little bit more. I'm going to take five more minutes. All right. And then there will be five minutes for questions. If you want to go early and you don't find it useful or you, you're you know, busy, you can go. There's never any compulsion to stay. Right, deixis, does anyone know what deixis means? Um, deixis means to point to something. Um, so this is language that points. So these are words like here, and now, and there, and then, um, and through. So this sometimes they're proper prepositions, and sometimes they're not. They are words that I use to indicate time or place or space. Okay, now we could do a whole hour's worth on deixis. This is very much A-level English language now. Um, but this kind of idea of pointing at things, and some things are close, like words like now and here and this, and some things are remote, like then and there and that. And, oh gosh, Beth, really, have I lost 20 quid? And then there are some that are a combination of the two, like through. So in the poem, what I've done is I've underlined the, that there aren't that many, but I've underlined some uses of deixis um, that I would say give us a sense of Blake or the narrator, Blake's closeness to his subject matter. Does that make sense? He wanders through. He's near. Although the word near there indicates that the, the street is near to the Thames, but it doesn't really kind of matter because Blake is wandering there anyway. OK, ignore, ignore the chat window, ignore the chat window, ignore the chat window. The word meet is, it, it operates in a, in a deistical way because it's to do with closeness. The word I hear, it suggests that he's close enough to hear it. Uh, which is then repeated again later. So there is some, and what you could write about, and it doesn't work as well in London as it does in other poems. If you look at Remains by Simon Armitage or Storm on the Island, um, you've got poems there that use it much more frequently. But deixis means that, that we are observing how close the speaker is to the subject matter. Does that make sense? Or more remote. Um, and I think you could say something about the fact that the poem begins, as I've written here, with a real sense of closeness. We're moving through space. But it becomes more distant, more imagined, more as if Blake has heard about this or he's, heard, he's kind of seen it in the background somewhere. It's something he's aware of. It's less immediate. It's less in his face. But at the end of the poem, as he returns to this but most through, I should have underlined through again, we go back to the closeness once more. So you could write about the fact that William Blake is both close to London and the Londoners that he's seeing, but also there is this separation. Now, I don't know whether he meant that or not. And that's one of the great things about stylistics is it doesn't really matter. Um, you want to be able to analyse what you've got in front of you without having to worry about what William Blake thought about 220 years ago when he wrote the poem, because it doesn't matter. All right. My A-level students should know it doesn't matter. The death of the author it really doesn't matter. Modality, which you don't really have time to do, but modality are things like um, auxiliary verbs and things like will, might, should. Um, so within the poem, we're looking for words like might or should or must or will, but we don't have any in London, so there's no point dwelling on it. We just move on to another another strategy uh, of analysis. There are adjectives used, though, blackening and youthful, but they're only used quite sparingly. There aren't very many. Um, Blake doesn't, doesn't do much of this in this poem. His verbs are mainly kind of descriptive um, verbs. Does this mean maybe that the poem lacks a bit of power because it doesn't it doesn't stress the point. It doesn't make kind of reinforce the point. OK, I've nearly finished. Um, I'm going to look at the chat window in a minute. And I hope there's some wonderful comments in there. The big picture, again, those bullet points, 14 or however many there were. Well, of those 14, how many are relevant to London? Most of them. 
you could even argue that some of them are that I haven't included are relevant. Pacing, character development or, or dialogue depends on how you feel the poem operates as a monologue. Um, all of those things you could look at in detail. Line by line elements, well, quite a lot of those are going to be relevant to London as well. But what about context? Because it's AO3 and because my exam students all know that AO3 counts. Well, once you've got your language done, your stylistics done, then how can you marry in your context? Well, now it's much, much more efficient. Because if you're able to talk about the clashes and the tensions in the poem, if you're able to talk about the kind of the repetition of ideas or the deixis of ideas or the use of nouns and pronouns, then you can match that stuff up to the context. Blake's life, his biography, his contemporaries, other romantic poets, niche knowledge that you might have plucked out in some way, uh, religious connotations, definitely in William Blake. Um, the poem is part of a series of other poems. That's context and that is useful. French Revolution, all the stuff you know about the French Revolution. I know very little about the French Revolution. Or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the philosopher who's you know told us that we were born uh, free but everywhere in chains. All of that's relevant because Blake loved that and Blake was a supporter, obviously, of the French Revolution. And um, other writers or other artists, he was an engraver in other eras um, and other critics' perspectives. All of that matters to me as an English teacher, but it doesn't matter anywhere near as much as this, language first your engagement with the poem as a language event. This happened, this poem happened, it was structured and conceived. It is a work that needs to be analyzed in detail through its lens, through the lens of language first and foremost. I think what I've done with you today, and it's very much an introduction, gives you some tools to respond to any text from any genre or form at all, or any period, Look, uh, do me a favor if you want something as a follow up. Go away and look at Storm on the Island. Go away and look at Tissue. Go away and look at the emigre. I was going to use the emigre as an interesting example if we had time. And see how those poems work in exactly, the, not exactly the same way, but you can use the same strategy with those texts that we've used today. And that is where I leave it. But hold on. Hold on, I want to plug my next two sessions. So the next one of these lectures will be on the 25th of February. And it doesn't sound very exciting, form and structure in an inspector calls, but my gosh, is it going to be good. So that one is, year nine haven't done an inspector calls yet. It doesn't matter if you want to attend, it's up to you. Um, on the 11th of March, this one's a bit of a risk because I know that students want the best grades and they don't want to just have fun with English sometimes. But we're going to do some poetry writing as a group. Um, and again, it's optional. You don't have to be there if you want to. I've got some really great activities that I've really enjoyed before. If you want to come, you are more than welcome. I've scheduled that already. But that is it. If you've, I've got one minute. If you want to stay and ask questions, I'll, I'll stay for another five minutes. Otherwise, have a fantastic day. Um, and I'll speak to some of you tomorrow and some of you next week. Bye for now. Feedback, please. Feedback. I like feedback. Anything that you can say, what's been helpful, what's not. Too hard, too easy. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. I'm stopped recording.